accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. Billions of people. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Paradigm. I'm your host, Paul Breckell. Today, my special guest is Derek Gilbert. Derek has been podcasting since before podcasting was fashionable. He is a researcher and he has wrote books, including The Last Clash of the Titans and the book that we're going to be talking about today, The Second Coming of Saturn. If you enjoyed this discussion between me and Derek, would you give it a like and also subscribe to the channel? And it'd be appreciated if you leave some comments as feedback and it's appreciated that you've tuned in to listen. So just sit back and enjoy this episode. Welcome to the show, Derek Gilbert. Thank you for joining me. It is an honor, especially finding out that you're uh, living in North Wales, which is the land of uh, some of my ancestors anyway. Uh, oh, I am okay. a descendant of the 15th noble tribe of North Wales, Marionethshire, which I've never visited, but would love to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place, is North Wales. Um, I moved here from the northwest of England. It's more rural. Where I mm -hmm. live, I have a, a view of the the seaside and i've also got all the hills behind me so uh it's, it's a lovely lovely place to live um, well, i also have uh, ancestry in in the northwest of england too a, a oh, uh, one of the 24 legendary knights of king arthur Bluark hain who was the king of south regat back in the uh what was that be late fifth century early sixth century uh so wow. anyway uh yeah some of the oldest extant poetry in britannic was written by him so I, I guess if i have a gift for for gab perhaps it comes uh, honestly through my welsh ancestry wow yeah wow whereabouts whereabouts in northwest of england would you say you've got descendants well it'd be lancashire i guess that's where the oh, uh, that's where of, i'm of, from the kingdom of uh reggaet uh, r-h-e-g-e-d i guess was uh yeah there was a a, a uh, oh gosh what was the the last king who was uh, defeated by the the Sa the Ac Angles and Saxons? Uh, Harold. Owain. No, no, it was Harold. Harold that, no. that was in 1066. I'm I'm thinking yeah, farther back in the uh, yeah the early uh, early sixth century, I think. Um, uh, it'll it'll come to me later. Uh, you, of course, you probably I, I've done a lot of reading. Me. <laughs> done a lot of reading on the the uh, the age of King Arthur and and uh, thereabouts. We we were blessed to visit the UK back in 2019, and we could have spent a week in the British Museum, but uh, we we traveled up. Didn't get over to Wales, but we did get up to Scotland because uh, Sharon is uh, of the clan Fergus, and uh, so uh, we had to get up there. And of course, a, a lot of her um, characters in her series of. Uh, uh, supernatural thrillers are of Scottish descent. So we had to get up to uh, see uh, Loch Ness, but uh, some of the regions around there, um, uh, Glencoe, for example. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, so yeah, it was, it was wonderful. We'd love to come back. And uh, in fact, there's a chance we may be back there in uh, late October uh, for wow. a, uh, uh, the Nephilim anthropology conference uh, near Glasgow. So uh, hopefully right, we'll be able right. to come back and spend a little time there again. Some parts of Glasgow will be a bit of a culture shock for you, Derek. I can assure you, <laughs> <laughs> and you might need a translator. <laughs> well, we watch a lot of we 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 actually watch more British television than we oh. watch uh, American television. So okay. we 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 have picked up on uh, uh, the some of the the idiosyncrasies of S Scottish, Irish, uh, and even uh, uh, and one of the things we found really funny, Paul, was when we were driving up the M1 from London with a friend of ours who is uh, actually Spanish by birth, but he married a Scottish lass. And so he learned to speak English from Scottish friends. So he's got a Spanish <laughs> Scottish yeah. accent, but as we were driving North on the M1 and just seeing those signs that, uh, you know, to Carlisle, uh, Birmingham, and then in all caps, the North, as though there's yeah. something like ominous about going to oh, the yeah. North. Uh, yeah. It's a different world than the South. Especially well, we, when, you, we've, yeah, we picked up on that. Yeah, definitely. So you have offered a number of books, including The Last Clash of the Titans. Some of the titles of your books are brilliant. I mean, The Last Clash of the Titans, that's just got to want, you know, get you to want to read it just with the title. Bad Moon Rising, and obviously the book we're talking about today, The Second Coming of Saturn. And I know you've co-authored a number of books with your wife, Sharon, as well. I mean, for the people that don't know, even just the actual artwork of your books is brilliant. I love the artwork on them. 
But just before mm. we go any further, one of the things I'd love to comment on is, so I follow you on Instagram, the memes that you put on, Grace memes. <laughs> <laughs> They're funny. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we got a dog um, back in November. Uh, she's In fact, she's sitting about uh, six feet to my right here, um, sleeping, actually. She comes out to uh, this this uh, space that we uh, have. It's, it's a 30 by 40 foot uh, pole barn, a metal building on a concrete slab that we've recently been able to convert into usable studio space. And um, we got her in mid-November. Uh, she had uh, turned up on the property of somebody about 35 miles west of us on Halloween night, just shivering cold. Um, she had been wandering around. Apparently, the town that we do our banking in, uh, the town where we worked with Skywatch TV for years, and we still work alongside Skywatch TV, just do all the work from here at home now. Um, mm -hmm. She'd been wandering around loose in town for a while. And uh, so anyway, we uh, said, well, look, if, if no one has claimed her, uh, there, there are a couple of very active Facebook groups in our area for lost and missing pets, um, and and no one had. So we uh, met with the owner. We picked her up, brought her, brought her back here, and uh, she has turned out to be a wonderful dog. She is, uh, in fact, a, a breed that was very popular in the UK back in the uh, 19th century as a gun dog, called a flat-coated retriever. And it just happened that one night, as Sharon was just taking pictures of Grace. While they were sitting on the couch together, she got one of Grace just sort of looking at Sharon with a kind of raised eyebrow sort of look, and then another where she's yawning, but it looks for all the world like she is laughing her head off. And a friend of ours uh, turned it into a meme for uh, just a, you know, a dad joke, you know, just a, one of those bad pun jokes that dads love to tell. And uh, so I, I stole the idea. So now it's just sort of become a, a thing every night. As I, you know, to re to help me relax, you know, after a day of mm -hmm. looking into um, geopolitics and as Sharon calls them, theopolitics, the principalities and powers behind the scenes, mm -hmm. just finding a goofy joke with a dog that looks like she's just having a wonderful time, just to just to relax. Like, hey, look, there are things in this world that are worth defending, that are mm -hmm. worth our efforts to protect even if it's just a bad, gentle spirited joke. Um, and of course these wonderful animals that God created for us, cats, dogs, birds, whatever, um, that we were given dominion over. Uh, so just a, a little thing. And, and I hope it just brings a, a smile or a laugh, but, uh, yeah, it, it uh, gives me something to do as I'm winding down for the evening, you know, try to look for uh, the evening's joke. Yeah. Oh, it definitely brings a smile to my face. I see them every day, like I go on. Yeah. And I just thought I'd mention it to you because they are good. And like you <laughs> said, it's just that. it's just it's just harmless fun. I mean, you can't beat a little joke like that, completely clean. And it, it's for guys for those guys who don't follow Derek on Instagram, it's worth following them on Instagram for the memes, if anything <laughs> else. <laughs> so so the second coming of Saturn is the book I want to talk to you about. And that I believe okay. is your latest book. And you, you yes. wrote that the powerful people believe that the stars have aligned to bring back Saturn. So who is Saturn? Saturn is uh, the god who was uh, the, the patron of the most popular festival in the Roman calendar of, uh, of festivals honoring the gods, the Saturnalia, of course. Um, but he was known by many names throughout history, and this was known to the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the 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 Hurrians and Hittites of the ancient world. When you start looking at their god lists, translators who would translate from, uh, say, in in the biblical era, it would translate from Akkadian into Canaanite, or Akkadian into Egyptian, or uh, you know, whatever, uh, so, sort of like the ancient clay tablet version of Google Translate, so that you would know if you were venerating, say, Enlil of the Akkadian pantheon, he would be called Dagon by the Amorites, or El by the Canaanites, or uh, Milcom by the Ammonites, or Kumarbi by the Hurrians and Hittites, so you'd know who, who you were talking about. So when you start tracing the history of this entity back through time, from Saturn backwards, you know, Kronos of the Greeks, Baal, Haman of the Phoenicians, not to be confused with the storm god Baal, which is just a term that means Lord. Baal, Haman is a separate entity. Um, you, you see that this character has been venerated going back more than 5,000 years. In fact, the oldest iteration is not Sumerian, uh, the Enlil uh, character who was the, uh, the father god of the Sumerians, but the Hurrians 
who called him Kumarbi, who came from northern Mesopotamia, basically the regions occupied by the Kurds today, northern Syria, northern Iraq, um, southern Turkey, western Iran, uh, down in an arc around Mesopotamia, down into the, uh, the lands of the Bible, where they were called the Horites in Scripture. Uh, this entity, uh, we can trace back to his origin point with these people, the Hurrians, who emerged in the 5th millennium B.C., uh, on the plains of Ararat. In, in other words, the lowlands below the mountains where Noah's Ark came to rest. And in all of these iterations of this entity, Saturn, Kronos, Baal Haman, El, Enlil, Milcom of the Ammonites, which means he was Molech in the Bible, the entity who demanded children to be sacrificed. In every one of these iterations, this entity was connected to the netherworld, and in certain of his iterations, specifically Molech, Baal, Haman, Kronos, Saturn, it was known that he demanded the sacrifice of children. And this was known to early Christian authors. He said, well, look, everybody knows that he ate his own children. If you know the Greek story of Kronos, who overthrew his father, the sky god Uranus, castrated him. And then it was prophesied that uh, one of his children would overthrow him, depose him, and take over as uh, king of the universe— uh, he ate his children as they were born. It wasn't until the last one was born, Zeus, that Kronos' wife, uh, Rhea, began to detect a pattern there. She was a little slow, apparently. And uh, to fool Kronos, she gave him a stone to swallow instead of the baby. And Zeus was raised in secret. Zeus, the storm god, uh, the equivalent of Jupiter in the Roman pantheon, but also the equivalent of Baal in the Bible. Same entity by different names. Uh, we, you you see these these parallels in these these ancient pantheons. Um, so anyway, Zeus uh, frees his colleague or frees his uh, siblings. Um, basically, forces Kronos to vomit them up, and then they go to war against the Titans. They depose Kronos and the Titans and banish them to Tartarus, the bottomless pit. Well, interestingly, when you start looking at the biblical accounts of sinful angels. Uh, there is there is a mention in Second Peter two verse four where he says that uh, writes that God did, did not spare the angels when they sinned but cast them down to hell in our our Bibles but the word in Greek is actually Tartarosis it's Tartarus not Hades these were separate places in the Greek mind this is the only place in the New Testament where the word Tartarus is used it is not a synonym for Hades. And as our friend, the late Dr. Michael Heiser used to say, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's probably important. So when you start piecing the evidence together to finally get around to answering your question, um, Saturn is just the most recent iteration of an entity who has been with humanity since the garden, I believe. And in putting the evidence together, I concluded that he was the entity referred to in the book of First Enoch as Shemiyaza, the chief of the watchers who rebelled against God. These would be identical to the sons of God mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, who in turn are identical to the titans of Greek and Roman mythology, who in turn are identical to the Anunnaki of Sumerian myth, or the Apkalu of Mesopotamia, the Mesopotamian conception of the Hebrew watchers. The stories are parallel, not because it's coincidence, not because people just love telling the same story over and over again, but because the Bible contains a historical account and these other pagan accounts, what we call mythology, are the fake news version, trying to explain away what God did to put a stop to their plans. Oh, yeah, uh, the storm god rose up, uh, Baal, Zeus, Jupiter, uh, the Hurrians call him Teshub, the uh, Hittites call him Tarhunta. Again, same story over and over again. A storm god rises up, overthrows a grain god by the name of Enlil or El or Kronos or Saturn or Baal Haman banishes them to the netherworld, and then the storm god becomes the king of the pantheon. Well, uh, again, the Bible tells the same story. It's just that we in the modern church, we in the modern West, have been so conditioned to believe that uh, all of those other entities that the pagans worshipped in the ancient world are imaginary, mm -hmm. that we've de-supernaturalized the Bible and... Uh, drained the Bible of a lot of its uh, a lot of its power actually we we miss the full power of what Jesus came to accomplish on the cross and who exactly he is saving us from so Saturn I believe 
this leader of this rebellion in Genesis chapter 6 that tried to corrupt the human bloodline and also corrupt us through teaching us forbidden knowledge, I think he's the same entity who emerges in Revelation chapter 9 as the angel of the bottomless pit, the destroyer, Abaddon or Apollyon. Yeah, so Sam Yezer, as I believe, he's the leader of the 200 watchers talked about in the Book of Enoch. And remember, there's some others named, and I remember is it, there's Azazel as well, isn't there? But you see, yes. Sam, Sam Yezer is, is the leader. Because one, one of the things that I find interesting is, is that obviously we, as Christians, you know, Satan, Lucifer, whatever we want to call him, we see him as like the head of all these principalities and powers. But he wasn't involved in that original sort of fall with these 200 watchers, was he? No, there's no mention of Satan. And in fact, when you look carefully at the Old Testament, um, you, you see that there is no, there are barely any references to Satan at all in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's really important to note is that uh, the, the, the word Satan is not a proper name. It is a title both in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, and in the New Testament, in the Greek. It is accompanied by the definite article, the. So even though it's translated as a proper name, for example, in Job chapter 1 and 2, uh, and in uh, Zechariah chapter 2, I believe, where he is accompanying, or he's accusing the high priest in the time of Zechariah, um, named uh, Joshua. Uh, and then, of course, in the New Testament, where he's is treated as a proper name, it is always the Satan in the original language. It is never Satan, the proper name. It is the Satan. It is a, it's like a job title, the accuser, the uh, adversary, the prosecuting attorney. And when you see the few, just look carefully at the few references to Satan in the Old Testament, he's never connected to the netherworld. He's still wandering about the earth. He still has access to the throne room of God in Job chapters one and two. Uh, to this day, in fact, uh, Jewish religious scholars do not connect the Satan with the underworld. The idea that somehow Satan is the Lord of hell was an idea that developed in the early Christian church in the first few centuries after the resurrection of Jesus. A friend of ours named David W. Lowe, L-O-W-E, wrote a book about 15, 16 years ago called Deconstructing Lucifer, where he made this case. And at the time, I, I kind of laughed and said, oh, David, of course, everybody knows that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, you know, Isaiah 14 is the famous chapter that includes the line, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Everybody knows that's Satan. Well, how do we know it? When I started researching this and getting into Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, I realized, wait a minute, there is nothing in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, which scholars agree are parallel chapters about a divine rebel, a supernatural rebel who is cast out of Eden, cast off the mountain of God. That's how it's described in Ezekiel 28. Uh, there's nothing that connects him to Genesis chapter 3, which is the serpent in the garden, the Nakash who tempts Adam and Eve into disobeying God. So there's no connection there. Um, in Isaiah 24 and Ezekiel 28, he's cast down. In Isaiah 14, it specifically says he arrives in Sheol, where the Rephaim, translated into English as the shades, uh, rise up to greet him, saying, oh, you're as weak as we are now. But again, nowhere in the Old Testament, and really nowhere in the New Testament, is Satan connected with the netherworld, with Hades, Sheol, uh, it is a concept that developed in the early church. So the question then becomes, if this isn't Satan, and there's nothing in the Old Testament or New Testament that connects Satan to um, the the Nephilim, the giants destroyed in the flood of Noah, um, who is it then? Well, it would make sense if it was the one who led the rebellion on Mount Hermon, in, according to the book of First Enoch, that culminated in the in the creation of these hybrid monstrous giants called Nephilim and their spirits, which were later referred to as Rephaim, the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Um, it would make sense that this entity, Saturn Shemiyaza, was the one referred to in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 20. And I go into some detail uh, in, in chapters on this, uh, there, there's a reference to uh, in Isaiah 14 to Babylon, but we need to remember that in Hebrew, the word translated Babylon or words translated Babylon, Bab El or Bab Elu, based on the Akkadian Bab Elu, uh, is the same thing. So Babel, Babylon depends on the context. 
Is it a reference to the king of Babylon, a human ruler? Well, Isaiah was Isaiah lived at a time about 100 years before the rise of the Neo-Babylonian kingdom led by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. But uh, the king of Bab-el, king of the God Gate, would apparently be, in my view, and this is speculation, I and, and I, I say in all honesty, I haven't read anyone else has come to this conclusion. So either the Lord showed me something new or I'm way out in left field on this. So I'm, this is not a theological hill I'll die on. But it's possible that Isaiah 14 is referring to this entity as the king of the God gate, the king of Bob L. Um, and later in Revelation chapter 9, he's referred to as the angel of the bottomless pit, the king of those in the bottomless pit, uh, Abaddon, the destroyer. So um, I, I think that uh, th this entity uh, referred to as Lucifer, which is a, is a uh, Latin transliteration of the original Hebrew. The Hebrew name is actually Helel ben Shakar, which means uh, light bringer, son of dawn. Uh, Jerome is the one who translated as Lux and Pharos, Lucifer, light bringer. Helel, according to a scholar named William R. Gallagher, is actually a West Semitic or Hebrew transliteration of the Akkadian name of this entity, Elil or Enlil, who again is El, Milcom to the Ammonites, Molech to the Hebrews. So if this entity is in the abyss, as Peter and Jude, Jude verses 6 and 7, uh, allude to in their epistles, then is it possible that this entity and his colleagues were even more dangerous, in God's opinion, than Satan? Because Satan... Mm -hmm is still wandering the earth. And of course, we know from the book of Revelation that he is considered the uh, the leader of this rebellion during Jesus' time on earth. He's asked, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how is it you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, Baal the prince? And this is where Jesus connects Satan, by the way, to the storm god, Baal, Zeus, Jupiter. Uh, he says, if Satan cast out demons by his own power, how will Satan's kingdom stand? Oh, okay, Satan has a kingdom. So Satan emerges as the leader of the supernatural rebellion against God, but was it always that way? And why is he still wandering around on the earth while this entity, Shemiyaza, Azazel, and their colleagues are locked up in the bottomless pit, according to Peter and Jude? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's really interesting. If it was really important for us to know exactly the reasons God would have revealed that to the prophets and the apostles. It would be in the Bible. It's not there, so it, we can only speculate. But um, it is uh, interesting that this entity was so dangerous that he and his colleagues got locked up, whereas Satan is still allowed freedom for now on this earth. Yeah, I mean, as you're speaking there, there's all sorts of questions going around in my head. I mean, so in terms of then the end, the entity that we know as Satan that basically tempted our Lord in the wilderness, who would that have been like? Is is this the one that we traditionally think of as the leader? Like we would in traditional Christianity, we have this idea Lucifer is Satan, the devil, and he's the leader, and that's pretty straightforward mm -hmm. and that's it. Would that have been yeah, and, and, and you know, that entity that we always consider, that that would have been the one that was tempting our Lord, wouldn't it, do you think? Yeah, I, I would I would say that that is, in fact, Satan. But but again, just distinguishing that Satan and Lucifer are two different entities. Lucifer mm. is this entity, Enlil, uh, Kronos, Saturn, uh, Molech, Shemiyaza, whatever you want to call him, the Destroyer, Abaddon, Apollyon. That's all the same entity, and that's the, uh, the really the focus of the book, the second coming of Saturn, trying to identify who is this entity, how is it that he could lead this rebellion in Genesis chapter six that gets uh, that gets him locked up in the bottomless pit in chains in gloomy darkness, according to Peter and Jude, uh, along with his colleagues, um, and yet then he just sort of disappears from history. If he was that consequential back in the pre-flood era, why haven't we heard anything else about him? And my argument in the book is. There is a lot about him in the Bible under the name El, Asher, the chief god of the Assyrians, uh, Enlil, uh, which is mentioned sort of tangentially. There's a reference in Zechariah chapter 4, uh, not by, might 
by not by power, but by my spirit, says says God. I I, I have to I should have that verse memorized because it's it's one that gets uh, quoted a lot. But um, the next verse is uh, as he is uh, God is revealing this to the prophet Zechariah. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, who was the leader of the Jews, came back to Jerusalem from Persia and rebuilt the temple. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Well. Great Mountain was the main epithet or nickname of this entity, Enlil and Dagon, both referred to as Great Mountain. The temple of this entity, Enlil, was called the e Ker, which means mountain house or house of the mountain, located in a city in what is now central Iraq called Nippur. Uh, Zechariah Sitchin followers have mis- translated the name or transliterated the name as Nibiru. There is no planet Nibiru. That was the name of the city in ancient Mesopotamia where all the gods would meet at the temple of the god Enlil once a year to decree the fates of the land. There is no planet Nibiru. It was Nippur, um, sometimes transliterated Nibiru. But what's really fascinating is that, and again, this gets back to the UFO phenomenon in Ezekiel chapter one, where he has the vision of the wheels within wheels and the, you know, the, the, he sees the vision of the cherubim, which he describes in great detail. He mentions in Ezekiel chapter one, that he had this vision over the Kivar canal, C-H-E-B-A-R, the Kivar canal. And then he goes on to mention like eight more times throughout the, the vision that I had at the first over the Kivar canal. Why is that important? so important that he mentions it and then repeats it like eight times. It's because the Kivar Canal ran right through the city of Nippur, right next to the temple of the creator god of the Mesopotamians, Enlil, later known as Kronos, Saturn, Molech. God revealed his plans for the end times to Ezekiel right over the temple of the chief deity of Mesopotamia. Hmm. And This is not by coincidence. And Ezekiel made a point of letting his readers, who in the 6th century B.C. would have known exactly what was going on. It's like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Throne of God appears right over the temple of the most important God in Mesopotamia. That is so cool. It's like, boom, mic drop. That's what we're seeing with this entity. It's just he's sort of been written out of history, and we've lost that thread. We think, okay, well, Saturn, he's just sort of, you know, uh, made up Kronos. Okay, uh, Kronos. It's like chronology. It's a god of time. No, 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 no. This entity has tried to rehabilitate his image. In fact, there's there's a uh, a prophecy, or it's been interpreted as a prophecy, I should say, by the pagan Roman poet Virgil, written about the time 40 BC, just about the time Julius Caesar was assassinated, and uh, that brought the um, the second triumvirate into power. Uh, his nephew Octavian, who became Caesar Augustus. Mark Anthony, and then a guy, history is forgotten, named Lepidus, uh, who, <laughs> deservedly forgotten, um, he wrote a poem called The Fourth Eclogue, where he wrote that the, the ascension of Octavian would bring a new golden age, because it was believed, and, and this goes back to the Greek poet Hesiod, who wrote a lot of what we know about Greek mythology, that there were four ages of human history, the golden age, when Kronos ruled in heaven, or Saturn, if you're Roman, um, and uh, then a Silver Age, which wasn't quite as good. Then there was a Bronze Age; things were really tough. And now we're living in the high, the Iron Age, where the gods really make life miserable for us. But the rise of Octavian, Caesar Augustus, would bring with him a new Golden Age. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Well, there are occult adepts, and I give credit to Tom Horn. The late Tom Horn wrote about this in uh, Apollyon Rising 2012, Zenith 2016. Uh, There are occult adepts, uh, Freemasons and other groups, who who see this as an actual prophecy. And this gets back to uh, what you had uh, mentioned early on, that uh, there are those who see this as the return of Saturn. They see it as the return of a golden age. That was signaled by the great conjunction that took place on the winter solstice of 2020, December 21st, 2020. Many of us remember all the news articles. Oh, the Christmas star, Jupiter and Saturn in conjunction in the night sky. This must be what the three wise men saw. Well, no, that's not what they saw. But set that aside. There are 
it, it may surprise Christians to 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 see how uh, many wealthy, powerful people actually look to the stars to govern their their actions, their decisions. It, it really shouldn't. I mean, it, Ronald Reagan, for example, for many of us here in the United States, Reagan, one of our greatest, if not the greatest president of the modern era, uh, his calendar was set by his wife, Nancy, after consulting with her astrologer, Jean Dixon. So, um, you know, it, it reaches even into the White House, this idea that somehow the movement of the planets in the night sky have some bearing on our decision making. And this conjunction on the winter solstice, which is a an important day in the annual occult calendar, signaled the final full uh, entry of the world into the age of Aquarius. The, uh, the conjunction took place at zero degrees in the constellation Aquarius. And so 50 years after the uh, group, the fifth dimension sang that song, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Well, now we are fully into the age of Aquarius. But what they believe this signaled, not just the great conjunction, but the great mutation, the transfer of power from the storm god, Jupiter, the uh, king of the pantheon, who took over by deposing his father, Saturn, millennia ago, now handing power back to Saturn, the dawning of a new golden age. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a month after that, uh, the World Economic Forum announced its plan for the uh, the Great Reset. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that's what we're seeing. And in the book, I also uh, write about the uh, the January 6th riots that took place at the United, United States Capitol, which... Um, Sharon deserves the credit for spotting this. She wrote about it in a, a book, uh, an anthology published by Tom Horn called Zeitgeist 2025. Um, that that date, January 6th, happens to be the date on the Christian calendar called Epiphany or Theophany, which is traditionally the uh, the day when the three wise men acknowledged, recognized, and acknowledged the divinity of Jesus in in the uh, you know in the cradle uh, or in the manger, but. Um, it was a day that here in the United States, according to our political class, which includes the media, uh, it was the day that America's temple of democracy was desecrated. So a temple of democracy? No, for me, the United States Capitol is just a big office building where Congress meets. No, they keep referring to it, our temple of democracy, temple of democracy. So started digging and drilling into that. And uh, um, yeah, there, there's there's more supernatural stuff going on there than uh, is... Um, than you would think on first look. Yeah. Temple of democracy. I, I can assure people that uh, democracy is an illusion. It's definitely <laughs> illusion. We're well, under you the know, and, 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 and we're, we're supposed to be a representative republic. We're not supposed to be a democracy anyway. But uh, mm. the fact is the building is modeled on the Pantheon in Rome, which was devoted to the Pantheon of Gods there, um, mm. down to and including the Oculus, which is... Uh, like a, when you look up from the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol, you see this circular area inside on the underside of the Capitol Dome, which in uh, the Pantheon in Rome is actually open to the sky. And it represented the portal through which Caesar was supposed to ascend and apotheosize to become one of the gods. Well, in the 1860s, um, whoever, uh, I'm not sure, Congress, who but anyway, hired an Italian artist named Constantino Brumini to paint George Washington becoming a god. It's a painting called The Apotheosis of Washington on the underside of the Capitol Dome. So um, I'm sure Washington, and people will argue here in the United States, was he a Christian? Was he not a Christian? I, I don't know, but I think Washington would have been furious to see himself depicted as a pagan god inside the building where our legislative body meets. It's, uh, and there was actually a plan to have him on display in a crypt below the rotunda with a, an open area in the rotunda floor down to the crypt. So again, so it's like Washington emerging from the netherworld and rising to become, you know, take his place among the pantheon of gods. I, I think that is uh, similar to what this entity, Saturn, imagines is going to happen for him. He thinks he's going to rule and uh, will return from the netherworld at some point. And, I, and again, I think that's what the imagery uh, inside the United States Capitol embodies. It's, uh, I, I don't know if the, the art and architecture was deliberately planned to represent this, but uh, that that's how I interpret it. 
Yeah. I mean, as I understand it, and I mean, I'm by no means an expert on anything to do with the United States as an Englishman. I mean, I'm not great on my own history, to be honest. But anyway, I thought George Washington was a Freemason and that like Washington, D.C. was designed by Freemasons. Well, it was. Uh, it was. Now, there, I'm not an expert on Freemasonry, but I do know that a lot of what we think about Freemasonry was developed by um, uh, Albert Pike, who was a general for the Confederacy in the U.S., the American Civil War, the war between the states. And that was some, um, you know, 70 years after Washington died. So I don't know that uh, Freemasonry, when Washington was a Freemason in the late 18th century, was what it became under Pike's influence. But I will say this, um, the, um, the art and architecture inside the United States Capitol, uh, the fact that it looks like a pagan temple, which is not coincidental. The fact that it's named the Capitol. I always thought that uh, we called the Capitol, you know, C-A-P-I-T-O-L, as opposed to like a capital city, which is A-L. Mm. The Capitol is because that's what you call the building where your legislature meets. But it turns out in the 1790s, when Washington, D.C. was being laid out uh, uh, with Freemasonic symbol symbolism in the way the streets are being laid out, uh, the architect Pierre Charles L'Enfant wanted to call the building Congress House. Thomas Jefferson insisted on calling it the Capitol because that's the name of the Temple of Jupiter in Rome, the Capitolium on the Capitoline Hill. Now, okay, does that mean Jefferson was a Satan worshiper because, you know, the storm god Jupiter Zeus Baal is Satan according to Jesus? No, I don't think so. I think he just wanted to evoke the glory of the Roman Republic and this Republican experiment they were trying to put together here in the United States. But the fact is, the reason the Capitol is called the Capitol is because that's the name of the temple of the storm god in Rome, the chief mm -hmm. of the pantheon of the Roman Republic. And, and the reason it's called the Capitolium, by the way, is because when the foundation of the building was being dug in the 6th century B.C., under the direction of the last king of Rome, before it became the Roman Republic, a, a fellow by the name of Tarquin uh, the Proud, or Tarquinius Superbus, uh, he was, was informed that they had discovered a well-preserved human head as they were excavating for the foundation, which... Uh, in the for the Etruscans and Tarquin was uh, was an Etruscan. They were from a little further north from where Rome is located. Uh, that was a uh, a good sign because uh, human heads were how you communicated with the spirit realm. Okay, when you conducted your necromancy rituals, you wanted to talk to the spirits of the ancestors. You did it with a a human skull or a human head. So they they moved the and by the way, this this involved moving the temple of Saturn, which had previously been on the top of this hill. It was Mons Saturnus, or Mount Saturn. And he was deposed, just as in the old stories, when uh, he was overthrown by Jupiter and sent down to Tartarus. They moved the temple of Saturn down to the base of that hill, put the temple of J Jupiter on top of the hill, and they called it Capitoline Hill and the Capitolium because in Latin, uh, the capo, the head, was found when they excavated the... And that is why now the United States Congress meets in a building named for the temple of, of, of Jupiter in Rome because they found a severed head there 2,600 years ago when they were digging the foundation. And I think something like 37 or 38 states here in the United States, including our home state of Missouri, uh, have named the building where its legislature meets the Capitol. It all goes back to a, some guy who lost his head in Rome 2,600 years ago. Wow. And, and, the worship, wow. and the worship of Satan, basically, the storm god. Yeah, it's this is the thing. What people like, like you were talking about, like the supernatural elements, been it's been stripped away because obviously Genesis six. My interpretation is obviously that these were fallen angels who had sexual relations with women, and obviously within the camp that I'm in, the reform camp, probably the prevailing view is the Sethite view. Obviously, sure. that wasn't popular up until I believe Augustine, and then. But that, again, it's taking away the supernatural element. And I think, obviously, now with, you know, Charles Darwin's teachings and people believe in evolution, there's no... People are just disconnected from that reality that everything actually that's going on in this world is influenced by that other world that we can't see. And 
this so this being Saturn, I'm interested to know what you think. So in the last days, obviously we know there's going to be the rise of the Antichrist. And as I would understand it, and obviously this would be the teaching of historic tr traditional Christianity, is that, that that person, this Antichrist, is either like it's like basically the son of Satan or completely energized by Satan. So what's so what's Saturn's role? Well, we see Saturn as um, the destroyer, the uh, Apollyon or Abaddon. And I go into some some uh, depth on that in the second coming of Saturn. There's some evidence from the uh, the nickname that the uh, the the priests, the Jewish priests, gave to uh, the Mount of Olives in uh, uh, starting with the time of, of uh, Solomon in the 10th century BC when he built the the temple. Uh, thereafter, he built for his foreign wives some high places for their gods on the Mount of Olives, which is um, to the east of the Temple Mount, and it's about 200 feet higher in elevation than the Temple Mount. So these high places would then look down on the Temple of Yahweh, the Temple of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of this, the uh, the priests referred to it as the Mount of Corruption, but in Hebrew, the term is actually Har Ha Mashkith, which literally means Mount of the Destroyer. And of course, one of those one of those high places is a was a temple to Milcom, or Molech. Um, uh, I, I actually floated the idea to a, a couple of friends of ours who speak Hebrew, uh, Messianic rabbis uh, Jonathan Kahn and Zev Porat, and they said, "Yeah, that that's the, an accurate translation, Mount of the Destroyer." And um, so I feel comfortable in putting that out there. I also think that uh, there's some evidence in the emergence of the destroyer in Revelation chapter 9 that points back to the um, the sin of the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6. In Revelation 9, we're told that this entity and his hideous locust-like uh, colleagues who will torment humanity, all those without the seal of God in their foreheads, for five months. And this is an odd period of time. A lot of the numbers that are used in Scripture are symbolic, the number three, the number seven, which is the number of perfection, the number 70, which means the complete set, you know, all of them, not one left out. So when um, uh, Yehu uh, rises up and, and uh, overthrows the, uh, the, the son of Ahab in the northern kingdom of Samaria, the northern kingdom of Israel, and he kills the 70 sons of Ahab, did Ahab really have 70 sons? Based on what we know about Jezebel, probably not. I don't think Ahab was yeah I, I i i what it means is all of ahab's sons were killed the same is in uh, the story of uh, gideon where his son by a concubine abimelech uh, kills the 70 sons of gideon except for one who accuses him and then gets away uh, the point being that when you see a number that's odd Again, as our friend Mike Heiser used to say, if it's weird, it's in the Bible, it's weird, it's probably important. Look back to Genesis 8 and 9. We see that the number of days that Noah's Ark was on the water before it came to rest in the mountains of Ararat, it was 150 days exactly. Again, kind of an odd number. But in a 30-day lo lunar calendar, that's exactly five months. The five months that these entities get out of the abyss in the end is equivalent to the amount of time that the sons of God from Genesis 6 were forced to watch as their hybrid offspring were being destroyed in the flood of Noah while they were chained up in the abyss. So this is why I think we're connecting the same entities. Now, what is his role in the end times? Shemiyaza, Saturn, the destroyer. Uh, basically, five months to torment those who have, not, uh, who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I, I Sharon and I hold to a pre-tribulational view. We think that the church will be out of here before then. There will be some who will be saved, who will accept Jesus Christ during the tribulation or what we call the great tribulation period, that final seven-year period of history. I think it'll be exceedingly difficult to do so at that point, but there will be some because the Bible clearly says that there are those who will have the seal of God in their foreheads. Um, the Antichrist, who is represented by the beast that emerges from the sea in Revelation 13, uh, kind of an odd... Um, uh, chimeric entity with elements of, uh, uh, you know, tiger or lion and bear. And, uh, uh, then this really horrible, it's, it's callback to the beasts of Daniel's dream in Daniel chapter seven. Um, 
but this chimeric entity, which is um, partly feline, partly uh, uh, serpentine, is exactly how dragons were depicted in the ancient world, and specifically the chaos dragon, the seven-headed chaos dragon. We think this is Leviathan, chaos returning to Earth to basically deconstruct everything. I mean, we're told in Scripture, um, Book of Colossians mentions that uh, in Christ, all things are held together. You know, he holds all things together, created it all, holds it all together. What would be more antichrist than disorder or chaos? So we think um, the entities at work in the end times, Satan clearly leading the rebellion, Leviathan, we believe, is the spirit that will inhabit the human that we'll call the Antichrist. The destroyer, Molech, Saturn, Shemiyaza, uh, he gets out toward the end and uh, creates literal hell on earth for those humans who have not accepted Jesus Christ. I think the, uh, the woman who rides the Scarlet Beast, the woman who rides the Antichrist, the uh, great prostitute or mystery Babylon or Babylon the Great, we think that's the ancient entity known to the Sumerians as Inanna or Ishtar who was um, an entity who was known in the ancient world for being able to transform men into women and women into men. She was gender fluid. There are hymns that have been preserved in ancient Sumerian where she says, though I'm a woman, when I'm in the tavern, I am also an exuberant young man. In the Hurrian pantheon, the Hurrians, again, those people who lived in the north of Mesopotamia in what is now Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, there's a very famous... Um, set of inscriptions that uh, depict all of the deities in their pantheon and all the male deities are on one wall and all the female deities are on the other wall. Their version of Inanna called Shauska is on both. So this entity we think is the one who's riding the beast. And um, I think when you see the, um, the state of the world today and gender dysphoria and the sacrifice of children being the number one cause of death on planet Earth, I think that you can argue very, and, and we do publicly, that these two entities, Inanna and Saturn, Kronos, Molech, whatever you want to call them, are still influencing the world today. Now, how is it possible that Saturn, if he's locked up in the bottomless pit, can still influence the world? Uh, the same way a gang leader or mafia boss can influence action on the street while he's in prison. He's got minions. He's got demonic minions who can apparently take messages and communicate back and forth. Um, I speculate a bit on this in the second coming of Saturn. There's a chapter in the book of Ezekiel where he uh, goes into some description on, uh, I, I guess you'd call it the geography of Shale, where the, uh, the mighty men or the chiefs of the Gibberim are in the midst of Shale. And uh, it, there, there's a reference to Assyria being in the uttermost parts of the pit, which I, and again, I will fully admit, I, I've not seen other scholars make this, uh, spec, take this speculation and run with it. I think that that reference in Ezekiel 32, the uttermost parts of the pit, or Yarkate Bor in Hebrew, is the Hebrew conception of the bottomless pit, or Abaddon, or um, rather, um, a Tartarus. So, um, and that uh, this... Uh, it's it's a little confusing in Hebrew because again, just as the words Babel can mean Babel is in the Tower of, or the city of Babylon, the uh, the name Ashur can mean the chief city of the Assyrians, can mean the nation Assyria, but it's also a reference to their chief deity Ashur, who was just another name for Enlil, Molech, El, Kronos, Dagon, Saturn, etc. So. Um, I speculate that perhaps this is a reference to this entity, Shemiyaza, being in the bottomless pit, but still apparently close enough that there's some communication with the chiefs of the Gibberim or the spirits of the giants in the midst of Sheol. Um, it's speculation, again, not a theological hill on which I will die. It is certainly not a salvific issue. You don't have to agree with me to uh, accept Jesus Christ and... Uh, and be saved or redeemed, but uh, you know it is it is interesting. And I think the bottom line, the takeaway from all of this for me is that the spirit realm, the unseen realm, is far more active than we've been taught, and that Jesus really, you know, our, our Creator, 
in coming to earth and taking on this mission to become fully human while still being fully divine was to save us, not just from ourselves, but from all of these entities that want to destroy us and take dominion to this planet that he created for us humans to have dominion of. Oh, they're definitely active. I think, I, I mean, I think they're just continually active all the time. And like you mentioned, Ishtar spoke to Doug Camp about that. And obviously the transgender issue and, yeah. and how that's really like, it's it's the stepping stone to the transhumanism movement, and yes. and obviously linked to that's going to be like obviously artificial intelligence. I've heard you talk about that before, and you know you've got Elon Musk developing this neural link, and it's like man man again wanting to be God. But because um, yes. I know you're limited for time, and I did want to mention um, a couple of things. I know that obviously you, you do your five in ten. You, you're well upon your current affairs. And I wanted to get your assessment sort of on the situation in the Middle East. So obviously, you know, as we were told in the media, Hamas attacked uh, back in October, they attacked um, Israel. Now, I'm always suspicious. Well, I, no, let me rephrase that. I don't believe what the mainstream media tell us. I, I literally usually take the opposite view of what they're saying. Now, What's your assessment of that situation? Because the way I seen it is I wasn't I didn't believe what the mainstream said. I couldn't see how a nation with a powerful military like that and probably the most sophisticated intelligence service on earth, they had the Iron Dome, could be caught out like that. For me, I see it as like a false flag type incident. But what what's your assessment of the situation? Um, I, I think that the reputation of Israel's military and intelligence services was um, overstated. Uh, remember, our impression of their capabilities was also shaped by the corporate media. Uh, you know, wh why do we think Israel is so powerful? So because that's what's been reported in the media. But from friends on the ground there, including some who are now serving in the reserves in the IDF, they called up a million people and bear, bear in mind, this is a com country of 9 million people. We've got a million reservists who are now uh, serving there. The archeologist who spent a day with us at Gilgal Refaim is now walking around with an automatic weapon. You know, uh, the CEO of the tour company is running drones to check security for his village in Samaria, which is what the world calls the West bank. Uh, one of his tour guides is the major uh, in, in command of his reserve unit. So we, we've got a few friends who have, either been previously or are now uh, serving, not in the IDF directly, but uh, in the reserves at the moment. And um, their impression as Israelis who live there, um, live in the West Bank, in Samaria, Judea, is that the the nation had been divided by the, uh, the conflict over judicial reform, which was a big, big fight in Israel over the past year. And, and I'll just touch on that very briefly because nobody here in the United States would tolerate a judiciary with the kind of power that Israel's courts have. Their Supreme Court can basically strike down any law passed by the Knesset, their version of Congress or Parliament, just on the basis of whether they think it's unreasonable. And, and that's a, you know, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand that that's a legal term that that is so broad, you could basically define anything as unreasonable. Well, that's what the government elected by the people of Israel, you know, headed up by Benjamin Netanyahu, was trying to do, just to rein in the courts. The problem Israel has is that when they were trying to come up with a constitution back in 1948, their neighbors attacked. And so they had to kind of put that aside. They've never come back to it. So they don't have a constitution there that specifically delineates the, the rights, responsibilities, and powers appropriated to the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch, like we have here in the United States. So they were fighting over that and distracted by it. Um, the, the, the previous government headed up by um, Lapid and, and uh, uh, Naftali Bennett, which was center and center left, uh, began opening up more uh, passes, shall we say, uh, permits for people to travel from Gaza into Israel. And it's been disclosed since then that many of these workers who were then working in the Negev as, you know, construction, maintenance, whatever, cable installers, whatever, were actually collecting intel that they brought back to Hamas in Gaza. 
Uh, Israel may also have become too complacent and confident in its technological superiority that was just overwhelmed by um, just low tech. You know, we we don't use phones to pass messages anymore. We, you know, do everything by hand, uh, that that kind of thing. So I think there's a combination of things that can explain the um, the serious failure that happened on October 7th. I, I think, too, there's a mistake in assuming that somehow uh, Netanyahu thought he would get some political advantage by allowing a an attack like the one that happened. Uh, Golda Meir, back in 1973, she was the prime minister. She came out of the uh, conflict in 1967 as uh, uh, really as, as a hero. So in the late 1960s, Meir was very, very popular in Israel. Um, 1973 occurred. Um, the Israelis likewise were caught off guard and very nearly, uh, I would suggest without divine intervention, Israel would have been overwhelmed. I mean, the Syrians swooping down from the Golan Heights got to the west side of the Sea of Galilee and were convinced that the, there's no way the Israelis could have been this uh this unprepared it must be a trap and so they stopped they could have gone all the way to haifa before the israelis could have had time to re recover uh, the same happened in the negev the egyptians weren't prepared to consolidate the gains because they advanced so quickly they were stunned they thought they'd meet much more uh, resistance anyway the bottom line is israel managed to survive that but golda meir's career did not neither did moshe dayan who came out of 1967 and the uh, six-day war then as a hero but after 1973, Moshe Dayan, Meir, their political careers were ruined. So anyone who thinks that Benjamin Netanyahu planned October 7th, or at least allowed it, thinking that he would somehow gain some political capital, uh, just aren't really looking at history. Um, I'm not sure that Netanyahu will survive this, in fact. Now, um, how long is it going to last? We don't know. We'd really like to know because we had planned a tour for March. Obviously, that's not going to happen in March. We're backing it up to November, and uh, there's a real good chance we're going to back it up to March of 2025 because I um, saw a report over the weekend where Israeli intelligence estimates that they've managed to uh, eliminate about a third of, of the Hamas fighting force. It's taken three and a half months to do that. So if their goal is to crush Hamas, and Israel seems united based on what we hear from our friends there, in that goal, it's probably going to take most of 2024 to get that done. That's without Hezbollah in the north becoming fully committed, because if, mm. if Hezbollah does decide to fully engage, um, Israel is really going to have a, a problem because they are much better equipped. They've got better rockets, more accurate rockets. Um, there would be a real uh, a lot of damage to is Israel's urban centers. So. Uh, this is probably turning into a wider war. As we're recording this, of course, you know that uh, three American soldiers were killed over the weekend in northeastern Jordan. As um, We've got soldiers on the ground inside Syria, which uh, as an American, I don't really understand the strategic significance there. Trump tried to pull them out. The neocons here inside Washington, D.C. freaked out about it and uh, basically forced him to change course on that. But uh, these troops inside Iraq and Syria, American soldiers, have been targeted uh, over, what was it, more than 140 times, I think, since October 7th. And this mm. attack that uh, happened Saturday night, Sunday morning, left three soldiers dead, 34 wounded. Um, now, how do we respond? Do we go after Iran because these groups are backed by Iran? I don't know. Um, I do think that what has happened here which is not unconnected to what happened in Ukraine and whatever China may choose to do with Taiwan. Um, if things go the way they might, Paul, we could look back on this period of history as the early stages of World War III. Uh, there mm -hmm. are some who are saying is we're already in World War III. Um, there are some motives for China to try to strike sooner rather than later. Uh, their population is aging and shrinking. UN estimates, which are generally pretty generous because they want to convince us. Hello, Grace. <laughs> <laughs> they want to convince us that uh, uh, the world is overpopulated. Uh, China is expected to lose more than half its population by the end of this century. 
So if they're going to strike on Taiwan, they're going to do it sooner rather than later while they still have a, uh, a, a competent fighting force of young fighting age men. So, um, uh, and the same with, uh, with Russia and, and Ukraine. If, uh, I don't mean to be downbeat and, and 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 pessimistic. I think the one thing we need as Christians need to remember is that never in history does our Lord, the Creator who spoke all things into existence, uh, smack himself in the forehead and say, "Boy, I didn't see that coming." Um, this has all been foreseen and prophesied uh, yes. and revealed to the prophets and the apostles. Hi. And I think she's telling me that uh, time is up and she needs to go back outside. but okay. um, Bottom line is we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for a uh, a quick resolution there. Better cap my bottle of water here before she knocks it over in the electronics. Um, and uh, we we pray that um, uh, mainly because it would give us more time to do what we have been called to do by Jesus Christ, the Great Commission, which is to make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which... Uh, Interestingly, when you read 1 Peter 3, verse 19 and 20, he connects baptism to Jesus descending into the abyss, descending to proclaim to the spirits in prison. And I mentioned that in the second coming of Saturn. Again, this is based on a teaching from Dr. Michael Heiser. We had the, the blessing of hearing him teach on this at the Jordan River. But when you understand that that's what baptism is all about, it's a declaration of victory. It's like, hey, we got another one. And uh, by the way, you're still dead. Um yeah, it, uh, it is pretty uh, pretty energizing. So even though things look dark out there, again, our Lord saw all this coming. It's all been revealed. We just need to keep fighting the holding action and bringing the wounded behind our lines while the battle continues. Yeah. Yeah, he's not been caught out. He's definitely sovereign, thankfully. I'm running a poll Amen. at the minute on Twitter, and I think 75% of people who's responded fear that it's going to be world war three so you know there is a lot of fear out there unfortunately yeah. it's it's been wonderful talking to you derek and just before you go could you tell people where they can get hold of your books and about you know your podcast and everything because i know you do skywatch tv if you could just tell people about that yeah uh do uh, a daily news analysis for skywatch tv that's at skywatch tv.com skywatch tv also on roku apple tv uh, they've also got a, a, a mobile app, iOS, Android, Amazon, Kindle Fire, where you can catch that there. And Sharon and I do our, well, we've got a Bible study podcast. We've got a weekly geopolitical podcast, my uh, interview podcast. And um, what else? Uh, oh, yes, our weekly broadcast program, Unraveling Revelation, uh, which is, uh, you can get it, get all of that at our website, gilberthouse.org. We also have an app and our channel on Roku and Apple TV and soon to be on Amazon Fire TV as well. Um, just trying to get the information out there as best we can. But uh, gilberthouse.org is where you find links to all of that stuff. Our books are available, all major bookstores, Amazon, um, brick and mortar stores. Uh, but again, you'll find those at our store as well at gilberthouse.org. Thanks, Derek. And if, guys, you thought Derek had a lot of knowledge and you're impressed with everything he talks about, he actually says that Sharon, his wife, is the smart one, believe it or not. I've heard him say that oh, yeah. a number of times. So, <laughs> yeah, I definitely recommend listening to Derek and his wife and getting their books. So thanks again, Derek. It's been wonderful talking to you. Guys, I'll be back next week with a new guest. I'm Paul, and this is Beyond the Paradigm. Am I crazy? We don't use that word in here.